Well, welcome everybody to uh, this session of the Neglected Books Publisher Spotlight. Uh, this month, we're focusing on one of my favorite small presses, handheld books, uh, started by my friend uh, Kate McDonald. And we're going to be, uh, with each one of these, I've invited the publishers to pick the title that they want to talk about. Uh, and uh, Kate chose the uh, biography of Hilda Matheson, right? That one there. Oh, you've yep. got one too. Neat. Yep. And... <laughs> um, so I'm going to just introduce uh, uh, Handheld and uh, Hilda Matheson, and then we're going to have uh, a little question and answer with Kate, and then uh, open it up for everybody to uh, participate in the discussion, particularly, uh, hopefully some folks have had a chance to read the book, which came out in September. Uh, but first, let me go ahead and share. So uh, handheld books, you, you started in, it was at 2017? It's, it's handheld yeah, okay. press, handheld press, not handheld books. Sorry I, sorry, I couldn't get the domain name for handheld books. So we went for handheld press and I like that. Well, you know, it turns out when you, if you Google handheld books, you get a lot of, yeah, you, you get the wrong things or it's not a scene <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean it in that way, but yeah, you don't, uh, it's it actually don't get a lot of things related to books, uh, mm. believe it or not, in terms of images. But you've done quite a lot. Of, you've it's been a busy uh, six years here. It uh, certainly has got a lot of stuff out there, and this is just a small sample of the titles. Um, so uh, it's already to the point where uh, some bookshops are nice enough to bring them together. Uh, the way they do with Persephone's and in the old days with the Virago modern classic greenbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to confess that um, when I was doing my master's degree, I took a publishing seminar and I actually specialized on a little survey of publishers who did reissues because that's something that I had kind of been toying around with doing for uh, a long time. And so I... I took the opportunity to deliberately steal a lot of things from the best ideas I could see from various publishers. And you'll notice uh, that there was one point <laughs> we were heavily influenced by handheld. So like handheld, we try to stick with a dominant color that's unique to each title, which mm -hmm. gets to be challenging as time goes on, doesn't it? <laughs> Certainly does. But I'll leave that to my designer. She's got a superb eye for color and deciding how we're going to have, have the spine look compared to the front cover image. And uh, I just uh, recently sent this shot to her. So Handheld has definitely made its way around the world. So this is a, a bookshop we have here in Missoula, Montana, Shakespeare and Company. And uh, they have uh, more of your books than my books. So... <laughs> 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 so uh, that's quite impressive because this was just their display mm -hmm. table. They have many more on the shelves. So it's getting out there and getting readership uh, throughout the English speaking world and, and even uh, in other places, I suspect. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when I asked uh, Kate to pick a title, uh, this is what she chose, which is an interesting example of a neglected book because this book was actually self-published uh, in 1999. Poor Michael Carney couldn't find somebody to take up this fascinating story of Hilda Matheson. And, and where did you find this book, Kate? I found it in a secondhand bookshop in Dingwall, which is about 20 miles north of Inverness in the north of Scotland. And it was a surprise. I, Dingwall has two secondhand bookshops and it's not a big town. It's not a particularly wealthy town. So that was good. I don't. I can't remember why we were there. I think we were traveling back from a Scottish holiday to see my parents in Aberdeen. So Dingwall was en route. And naturally we were in there burrowing and I was intrigued by the name Stoker because that's all I could see was the spine, Stoker. And I thought, what is that? It was in the biography section. Right. I pulled it out and saw this gorgeous photograph on the front and I thought wow this is fantastic and it wasn't expensive so I bought it 
Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything much about, I'd never heard of Hilda Matheson. So it sat in my to be read pile for about three, four months. And then I got around to reading it. And then I thought, actually, this is wonderful. This is such a good book. I mean, it had editorial problems, but they were not big problems. They were just things I immediately started twitching at because I'm an editor. But the narrative was very clear. The references were numerous. This was clearly a book that had been researched properly. It wasn't um, an opinionated hagiography. It wasn't mm -hmm. a, a book just praising a person. And that was fine. And that was where we landed. And I, I had this book and I thought, well, this is really lovely. And then it wasn't until several years later that I seriously started thinking, well, maybe we could republish it. Um, we'd already republished one biography, I, I think our third book, The Aching Heart by Peter Herring Jug, Judd, which was a, a group biography of um, Valentine Ackland and her companion, Sylvia Townsend Warner and her American lover. And that too had been self-published. So I'd already gone through the process of tracking down a text I really liked, negotiating, altering and editing, and then bringing it out in a, an improved version. So I figured I could do this with Stoker. But the first thing I had to do was find Michael Carney. And I suspect, I think he must be pretty old. We have communicated, I know he's alive, and I'm not really willing to tell much more about him because I, I don't know very much but what I do know is, is personal to him but he, I think he's quite elderly and because mm. of his age and because of the date when he self-published that book 1999 it's fairly early on in the internet and I think he's managed very successfully to leave zero trace of himself online so really hard to track down I have no right. idea if he was British American it's just impossible but there was an address because it was self-published. There was a, a Welsh address in the publishing details in the book. So I wrote to that address, not a thing. And then I thought, mm, okay. And I looked, I used Google maps and I worked out from the address where the parish was. And I looked at the parish council and I wrote to the secretary of the parish council saying, do you happen to know Michael Carney? Did he ever live in the area in 1999, like nearly 15 years ago? And I got a reply saying well I know that I know the address I know the people who live at that address and I'll make inquiries and she came back pretty quickly with a forwarding address that the people who presumably had bought Michael Carney's house when he moved still mm -hmm. had but that was still pretty old so I wrote to that address and he wrote back very old typewriter and I thought oh wow old typewriter old school okay so I, I corresponded by writing letters and printing right. them and, it took me about two, a year and a half to realize, yes, he can use email perfectly well. I don't know why we <laughs> spent so long writing to each other, but he began. <laughs> anyway, he was delighted to hear from me. He was absolutely fine with anything I wanted to do. I discussed a couple of things that I wanted to do in terms of editorial intervention, partly making consistency happen, partly sorting out those damn references because they were not the right high standard. And there were a couple of chunks of text, not very much, maybe two pages here and about two pages there, which I thought should come out because they weren't about Hilda. They were just him going off on a tangent and saying things about present day BBC history. And I thought, mm. we don't need this. And he was fine. He said, as long as I don't have to do any work or appear or I don't have to do any effort because of his age, I think right. um, he was happy. So there we were. Um and, but then you, know, you add you you brought in the uh, the yeah. second part. So tell us about that. Well, when I well, the first thing was to get the text from the book onto my computer. Right. There is no he had no digital file to give me, so we scanned it um, OCR, then just produced it as an OCR uh, optical character recognition text, so I could proofread it properly. And then I realized, oh, OK, it's only about mm, 60,000 words. It's not really long enough for a book mm -hmm. or it will be such a slim book. It would be a bit fiddly printing it. And I thought there are areas of um, Hilda's life that I know about through looking at Wikipedia and after looking up um, like biographies of Vita Sackville West, doing a bit of cross referencing work in other people's biographies. There are areas of Hilda's life that are not mentioned in Carney's work. His work is good, solid but it's, it's partial. Mm -hmm. So I started to look around for someone who could um, fill the gap and looking on, I, I forget now how I came across her. I know it was, I went to the Nicholson's, Juliet and Adam Nicholson, who are 
Vita Sackville West grandchildren. Right. And Juliet said immediately, you must try Kate uh, Murphy at Bournemouth University. And somebody else independently has said, oh, you must try Kate Murphy. So that was clear. Kate Murphy was the one. She is a former producer of BBC Radio 4's Woman's Hour, which is a programme that Hilda initiated right. a long time ago. Um, when I contacted her, she was a senior lecturer at Bournemouth University. So I wrote to her there. She was very excited with the idea of doing more research on Hilda. Um, she had already written a book partially about Hilda in the connection uh, with Hilda's connection with the BBC about women who were in the BBC in the early days. So that's how that came about. So we came to an agreement. Um, I told her what I wanted and she said, yeah, I can do that. And she plunged into the research. So she was mm -hmm. able to use materials in the BBC archives. I think Michael Carney had not known about or had not had access to. And there were other materials uh, through not quite trade union connections, but Hil Kate's essay really focuses on Hilda's networking between women's groups, not necessarily right. political, but groups of women who were active and campaigning in the 20s, who Hilda was in touch with, either through her work for Lady Astor as her political secretary, or a little later, as the talks director at the BBC, looking for people to give talks. And Kate really filled in a very large amount of feminist history in Britain in the mid early to mid 20s, just focusing on Hilda and exploring who Hilda was talking to. And all these fascinating and now forgotten feminist groups emerge from the research. So we have, it's an unusual book because it's got two authors with two separate texts. And Carney's is much longer than Kate's, but I think they complement each other really well. And this Saturday, the Church Times, I've only just found out because they've only just sent me it, they did a review in their oh, wow. Christmas books guide, which I'm really happy about. So we'll be putting bits of that on our website, but they right. really like it. And you've also, uh, the Telegraph, I noticed, and uh, Daily mm. Mail even had something. So. Yeah, that was the surprise. I had no idea that 1920s lesbians were so popular <laughs> amongst the right-wing press in Britain because <laughs> this happened before. When we published our book on Valentine Ackland, which is a phenomenal biography of a 1920s and onwards cross-dressing communist lesbian poet, the Daily Mail gave it a rave review, but so did the Morning Star. So you've got the gamut of political right. thing there. But for, for Hilda to attract right-wing press, well, I don't think it's the right-wing press. It's the book that the literary editor of both newspapers felt that their readers would really be interested in Hilda. Right. So they're they're keen on lesbians there, and that's. that's good. <laughs> I'm sure it's not that future alone, but uh, yes, who can I tell? Mean, who can tell? Yeah, she 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 had good taste in in who she had affairs with. So <laughs> I think so. She had affairs, not necessarily the most famous people, but two very 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 famous people. Right. In fact, the Daily Mail went and did a digest. Yeah. He asked permission for a contract to do a 3,000 word digest of the Hilda, Vita and Dorothy Wellesley, Wellesley combination, completely right, ignoring right. all the political stuff. Right. It took about two months to get the money off them, but I'm so I'm never going to do a deal with the Daily Mail again, but <laughs> the money went to Michael because it was largely right. was, um, right. serial rights that he, he had contracted. So. Let me just jump back and, and and let's talk a little bit more about Hilda for those who haven't read the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so now it's available as of September. So it's essentially out of print. And even when it was in print as a self-published book, I mean, the, the truth is, even though self-publishing has has really taken off with Kindle and eBooks and all that sort of thing and print on demand, the truth is most bookshops don't carry self-published books and won't. Mm. So even getting your hands on a copy of these things or uh, this thing when in its original edition was not easy. Um, so Hilda Matheson, not long lived. Um, and, and I want to talk about the networking aspect because I think this is one of the things I found really interesting about this book. But so she uh, well educated, uh, worked during World. I don't have any photos of of when she was working in World War One because, of course, they didn't they didn't photograph intelligence activities. 
wonder why. Uh, then she went to work for Nancy Astor, who was the first uh, woman member of parliament uh, uh, and also a very well-connected uh, person, uh, very busy. Uh, actually, uh, one of the authors that I'm kind of interested in, uh, uh, God, whose name escapes me at the moment, but uh, um, yeah, also, oh, Honor Croom, uh, later on, picked up the work. And I, I have a feeling Nancy Astor wore out secretaries like like a hard rider wears out horses. Um, and then she went on to become the first uh, BBC director of talks. Uh, and that was a contentious time, both bringing a lot of uh, interesting uh, material to the BBC, which was still trying to find its identity. Uh, interestingly, the BBC was not able to actually report news per se uh, in its original first few years before they decided, actually, the, I guess it was the general strike uh, uh, that led to recognition that they needed to use it as an information service as well. Uh, and this is a quote I found I like, I like uh, uh, from Hilda where she's talking about essentially this was trying to hit a higher standard for uh, the content that went out over the BBC. And so she stressed that it should not be a vice like gin or opium or binging uh, miniseries as we do today. <laughs> mm. um, and then uh, there was a little bit of a, a headbutting and uh, she left the BBC. And this is actually a, a letter that E.M. Forster wrote uh, essentially in protest after she left the BBC, uh, saying that essentially that the important thing for the BBC that it, it was that it encouraged freedom of expression and discussion, and that that's what Hilda Matheson was trying to bring uh, in her uh, guidance and her choice of, of people to participate. And, I mean, Forster is an example of somebody who came to the BBC because uh, of her influence and that sort of uh, culture of the day uh, being involved in, in the talks uh, process. Uh, and then uh, she picked uh, up a, a civil service job uh, in support of this Africa survey, which was, it's kind of astonishing that Britain had uh, colonized vast swaths of Africa without apparently ever taking a serious look at what actually was going on there. Uh, and and so this was a tremendous, I mean, imagine statistical, cultural, political, economic, uh, the range of material that were covered in what that was covered in this. Uh, and um, for better or for worse, the truth is that Lord Haley was not really in physical condition to do much of the work. So she picked up most of that. Um, Along the way, she managed to have a, a number of affairs, including two with, you know, quite prominent women of the day. And uh, Dorothy Wellesley, who was, uh, of course, a member of the uh, uh, nobility, and then uh, Vita Sacramento West, who, of course, later, uh, I guess, before that had had uh, Virginia Woolf as a lover. And they, of course, remained close for, for the rest of their lives. And uh, in fact, Sackville West wrote a nice uh, little piece uh, when Matheson died in The Observer. I always thought of her as a sturdy pony. And, and uh, this is really a touching, touching, but also sort of ironic piece in that what she acknowledges is that Matheson essentially was so selfless in her work that people tended to abuse her like a, like a workhorse and and it's not not you know unclear that uh Sackville West might have been one of those oh and let me escape there and just we'll get back to that at the end but so one of the things that I found interesting about this is I mean she's not a name character I mean she's not I mean there's there's an industry uh, of Bloomsbury books and Virginia Woolf and Vita Sacco West and all of that because, you know, they were scandalous, they were talented, they were prolific, they were, and they, you know, they, they socialized with everybody, they were at the nexus of 
of networks. And uh, although you'll find uh, Hilda's name popping up in uh, biographies, particularly of Sackville West, she's not really a core feature. And yet, as you find by reading the book, you know, she was at the, she was, had so many threads in her life connecting her to so much what was going on. And, and I just find that there are characters like this throughout history who are not well known. And, um, and yet you'll find once you start following the trail of where they go, that you can trace, you know, they essentially help you map what's happened in that time and that culture uh, with extraordinary breath. Uh, I was reminded of uh, Edward Marsh, who was a, a similar kind of character, a long-term civil servant, uh, but also connected, uh, homosexual, uh, sponsor, mentor of poets, uh, gave his money out, a nice uh, patron of the arts, and uh, another character who is behind the scenes, essentially, not 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 really a prominent feature. And yet, if you start tracing the connections out, you'll find an entire network gets built around them. And so uh, I, it's a shame. I mean, I hope this influences some biographers to start looking at the lesser characters. And I don't mean lesser as people, but less well-known characters uh, who can develop so many aspects and, and angles of uh, of a time that we are not necessarily aware of, like the connection between, you know, the feminist movements and the the pioneering days of the BBC and and you know, military intelligence during World War One and uh, and the connections into uh, carrying on in, into uh, those activities in World War Two, which you unfortunately uh, died uh, in the early stage of so. Um, amazing uh, that you stumbled across it, and and uh, lucky that we're we're able to bring this back. And I hope it, I hope it, as I said, I hope it influences other uh, biographers to look at. I mean, there are other Hilda Mathesons out there that oh, there just haven't be, yes. got, mm -hmm. haven't 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 gotten noticed. Yeah, I think part of the problem, specifically in the the Bloomsbury context. I've just noticed an enormous spider on my wall. Okay, I'll deal with that later. Um, in the Bloomsbury context, we have the cult of Virginia Woolf, which casts an enormous shadow on the lives of anyone else in that who were active in that period. Right. So, yes, Virgin the mention of Virginia Woolf will sell books. And that's exactly why I began the blurb with Virginia Woolf hated her, because you sell books that way. But Virginia Woolf is a really a very small part of Hilda's own story. But right. You, you, it's annoying that you have to anchor it to a known selling point, but at the same time, this, that anchoring point is fairly irrelevant if you're focusing on Hilda as the centre of her own story. I would like to know a great deal more about her First World War espionage work, well, not espionage, intelligence work. Right. Um, and I also want to know why Angela Thurkle, and Kate Murphy and I have discussed this at length, Angela Thurkle, who was a novelist from 1935 32 onwards, in one of her earliest novels um, called Wild Strawberry, she has a woman character who's a, a manager at the BBC who has got two young men who are very camp and willowy and wear their fair isle jumpers tucked into their trousers, um, has her assistants. And she has this woman as a, a very brusque and not particularly attractive character in the novel. And Kate and I are both convinced that this is Hilda. We have no evidence that Angela Thurkle ever met Hilda Matheson, but it's pretty likely she did if Hilda was bringing in famous people for talks, because Thurkle might have done that. So you get this sense that Hilda was a known, a known personality in her own world, but all traces of that have been left, apart from this sort of driftwood effect in a novel by Thurkle and in the diaries of Virginia Woolf grumbling about her. But other information about her by you know, the diaries of much less well-known people, completely gone, and we'll never know about it. It's, um, yeah, we can't possibly expect to recreate the history of the universe. No, no. Yeah, but but, but you did have her love letters, which is yeah, remarkable. They were, they were, they were, I guess Vita Sattva West kept them, but we don't have any of Vita's because Hilda's 
brother was her literary executor or her executor. And I think it's, I think we in one of the Carney or Kate Murphy say that Hilda's mother would have probably destroyed anything in Hilda's possessions shortly after her death that she did not want to survive. Yeah. But also the brother, although I don't think he, I mean, he had a good relationship with his sister, but very little is known about him. Um, it's possible that he too suppressed material or kept things quiet or destroyed them as well. So the family, very Presbyterian family, Hilda was not Presbyterian, but her father was a Presbyterian minister. That has an influence too. Mm -hmm. One set of I I ideology, you know, conflicting with what the daughter went and did. Yeah, well, that's actually the my biography subject, uh, Virginia Faulkner. Her her brother came in the day after she died and gathered up all of her personal letters uh, and burned them. Mm. Uh, I mean, she she uh, he I mean, she was a wonderful correspondent, which is a, a shame. Uh, and he kept letters that she had written him uh, throughout their lives, but uh, her personal letters to her partner, yeah, it's all gone. So, yeah. you know, just to get well, is their right to have their, their work suppressed or destroyed if they want it, but if there's no instruction. And Hilda didn't think she was going to die. Well, yeah. That was the awful thing. She died in, the, in an operation, which was routine. So I think her death was a terrific shock to everybody. She was so young. Yeah, right, right. And who knows what she might have gone on to do in, yeah. in War II. Uh, I mean, she got started, but it was mm. in the early months of the war when she died. Yeah, probably remained in intelligence, but still, we don't know. Well, right in that gray area of public information and intelligence, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> propaganda information etc yeah uh, manipulation of the truth but to what end and for what reason and is it justified and under whose con under whose instructions lots of gray areas right right in wartime yeah things are different um the other book that you were thinking about uh, covering or, or or featuring this month was the ann stafford book oh uh, it's not out yet so it's a good thing i didn't <laughs> <laughs> Now that comes out in January. That's a wartime book. Right. I haven't actually, I, tomorrow the copies arrive. I haven't even got a copy to wave at you. But yes, um, Anne Stafford. So about three years ago, we published a novel called Business as Usual by Jane right. Oliver and Anne Stafford. Both those names are pseudonyms. But these two women met in the very early 1930s and collaborated on a novel, which was Business as Usual, which was light, frothy, fun, love story, epistolary written in letters with drawings and it was brilliant and it still is our best-selling novel it's just wonderful and those two women have been completely forgotten they had long and prolific careers writing together as a, as a duo under a single pen name under their own pen names writing romances for Mills and Boone writing historical fiction writing for children so from pretty much from 1930 right to 19 late 60s when they were both they both died anyway in the war Anne Stafford was, like Jane Oliver, was a volunteer driver in the London Ambulance Brigade. So they drove ambulances during the Blitz. And Anne wrote this really good fictionalised memoir, autobiographical novel, with named characters who were not her and her friends, but probably drew on real people, about the Blitz. And I read it and I thought, I, I dithered for two years thinking, shall we publish this? Oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I don't know why it took so long to make my mind up. Anyway, we're bringing it out in January and it's very good. It's very good. And it has drawings that Anne Stafford did when she was on duty or when she was you know, waiting to be called up. So you get these gorgeous little pen and ink sketches of people in 1940 and 1941, what they look like putting their socks on, you know, what they look like asleep or waiting for telephone calls and working in canteens or staring at a bomb site it's, it's right, right it brings the war really really close back because this yeah these are authentic images from the period and they're hastily dashed off they're just sketches but she was a very gifted illustrator so mm -hmm. we're very happy to use those as well but it seems like uh, books related to the blitz are still kind of sell like hotcakes it's still a mm -hmm. popular topic it's, it's strange, i mean you had yeah. uh, your Inez holden books uh, Inez, which Inez were extraordinary holden, yeah. too mm -hmm. 
How, um, how did you come across those? Inez. Uh, Inez Holden, I had never heard of. She was a bright young thing in the company of Evelyn Waugh and Stephen Tennant and the 1920s sort of Oxford set in London. <coughs> and then during the war, she kind of... Tra Sorry, Diane just left a comment. The, the book is going to be called Army Without Banners, and you can find it on our website. It's already available for pre-order. So Army Without Banners. Um, so Inez reinvented herself at the beginning of the Second World War as a journalist, writing for the BBC, sort of writing scripts and writing long non-fiction reportage and eventually writing novels. And she was very close to George Orwell. I think it's likely they had an affair and they began to write a book together, but he dropped out because of other work. So she began keeping a diary called, um, it was something like, it was like this at the time. I've forgotten the edge of that phrase. And at the same time, she was using that diary um, to write this novella called Nightwork about what it was like working in a camera parts factory in the night shift in, the nor in North London during the Blitz. So I knew nothing about this, but my friend Kristen, who teaches at University of Monmouth in New Jersey, she got in touch saying, Kate, Kate, you must, read, you must read this, it's amazing. And we need to produce it as a book because she's been teaching Inez Holden for several years using scrappy old photocopies of the one copy she had made from the London Library because Holden's books are very hard to get hold of. So I read the books and I loved them and I thought, well, they can go together. We can have these two together. And a year later, I brought in another Holden book. There's no story there, which is a, a proper novel about an inventive munitions factory in the north of England. Um, but Nightwork and the diaries together, they, they talk to each other. They reflect upon mm -hmm. each other because one's fiction and one's not. And you can see where they're coming from. And that was some, um, yeah, we really... We got a good boost from doing that because here was a new voice from the Second World War that had not been heard before. And very often in the literature and the formal study of the Second World War, the voices one is inspected to, expected to read are male. You very rarely get an authentic female voice writing about war in a serious way, the way that the men do, in, in a mm -hmm. way that male or academics will take seriously. The women's voices tend to be very domestic um, from mass observation or writing ditzy little columns about isn't it fun in the Blitz and so on. It's unusual to get a serious journalistic voice. And Inez Holden is one of those women. So for that reason alone, I was very pleased to have discovered her. So we published Blitz Writing, which is those two works together as one slim volume. And then this later novel, um, there's no story there. Right, right. Uh, one thing that I found interesting is you uh, you included uh, an academic sort of oriented uh, piece by Kristen. Uh, I assume, I mean, to me, that's one of the things uh, that I try to do with the recovered books is is to include an academic afterward, uh, in part because I want to encourage further study and research and writing and kind of integrating the books and the characters and the authors back mm -hmm. into the dialogue. Uh, have you had much response from the academic community in that regard? Um, well, for a start, I, I try not to have them be academic. My, I'm very keen that all the references in the introductions to our books can be found by anyone in a public library. Mm -hmm. I don't want journal articles that can only be accessed by somebody with a university card. Right. It's much more important. If my mother, who is not an academic, she's a retired elderly woman, if she's interested enough to want to find out to read more about one of the novels that we've republished, I want the book, the, the further reading list to give her names that she can look up herself in the library. I'm happy to have, I like academics to do the writing because very often they are the only experts on that author. And from time to time, I have to write the introductions myself because I am the expert. I am the only person who knows anything about these people because nobody yeah. else is interested. Um, but so far, any, everybody I've asked has said, yes, absolutely, of course. And I've had some repeat offenders like Faye Hamill from the University of Glasgow. She's written one and she's going to be doing one for us next year as well. I think there's only been one academic who's not replied ever and it's possible i just had the wrong email address but mm -hmm. maybe we can't have everything 
Right, right. But so, so far, our books are taken seriously in the academic community and they're appreciated by people who are not at all interested in the introductions. They just want the novel, but they might want right. to go back and read them for a little bit of context or to find out, do they say anything about this weird thing? So I try to accommodate for all requirements mm -hmm. and not get too highfalutin about it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we kind of do the same thing. I tell I tell our contributors for the afterwards that we're looking for academic light. In other words, it's, yeah. don't, don't don't use jargon that. Uh, no no <laughs> theory. Absolutely no theory. No French psychoanalysts. Absolutely not. No. Exactly. Yeah. Basic and straightforward. Tropes, agencies, all uh, these kind of buzz. <laughs> alterity, no. <laughs> now, the weird series, you've had a great response oh, to that, yeah. it seems. Yeah, that's been amazing. I really, really didn't expect that. So to explain, when I set up Handheld in 2017, I, wanted, I had a wish list at the back of my head, and I knew I wanted to do science fiction, but that didn't come to anything, really. And pretty quickly, I learned that I cannot sell modern fiction. So we we let our modern fiction line fizzle out quite soon mm -hmm. because it became apparent that a book I had commissioned was selling like a hot cake. And this was Women's Weird, which is a collection right. of classic supernatural short stories by women writers dating from the end of the 19th century through to about oh, 1928, 29. I forget the dates. And I commissioned this because I've been reviewing um, an academic work on weird fiction, which is a kind of supernatural fantasy writing which straddles the ghost story and the horror story. And it's not quite either, but it's a very distinct genre, subgenre of its own. But fantasy is good enough. But I was reading this academic work with a view to reviewing it, and I thought, he's not dealing with any women. This is outrageous. And this come, this happens again and again when I review books from male academics. They simply ignore the women or they include Virginia Woolf and think that's it. That's the box tick. So I was so enraged and also curious because I thought, I know there are women writers out there writing in this period, which was an extremely influential, no, a very important time for writers of any genre because genre wasn't really invented at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. It was only after the second, the First World War that the magazine industry, which took most of their work, began to diversify and separate itself out into detective, to fantasy, to pulp, to the Western, Science to the romance. Fiction, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So separation- Romance too. And romance, yeah. But before the First World War, all this stuff was being published in all the magazines, all the story magazines, homogeneously together. So I asked a former academic contact of mine, Melissa Edmondson, who teaches at the University of South Carolina. I said, I'm looking for women who wrote weird fiction at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century. And she said, I have a list. <laughs> oh, OK. So I worked with her when we produced Women's Weird, and it was an absolute smash. People loved it. Uh, the fan, uh, the, the, the fantasy reading community in, in the UK and in the States just gobbled it up. And so pretty quickly, I decided that we need Women's Weird too. And then we started doing anthologies of some of the women writers Melissa had helped to uncover by producing volumes of their work as well. So we are, I think we have just published our ninth Weird anthology uh, wow. a few months ago which is a themed one on stone called the living stone yeah yeah um and we're very careful if it's not a woman focused one we're very careful that all the contributors are pretty much 50 50 men women mm -hmm. as well we're going to get those women back into the canon they've got to be known about but yes i had not anticipated that handheld would have pretty much half its output a third to a half of its output would be classic supernatural short stories that was I just never anticipated it, but right, here we are. Right. I'm good at what it. What was it's remarkable certain, is yeah. there, there actually are quite a, a few, you know, if you're familiar with English literature of, say, the 1880s to the 1920s or even 30s, I mean, though there are a lot of familiar names in all of these anthologies. Yeah, they really so are. The appetite for, for fiction in that kind of area, mm -hmm. you know, was considered well that you know that's just another thing you do uh, it is and edith wharton wrote really terrifying stories 
Edith Nesbitt, E. Nesbitt, very famous in the UK for her children's fiction, an amazing ghost story writer. We're bringing out our 10th weird of her ghost stories next year. Um, Stella Gibbons, much more famous for um, uh, com Comics. Cold, Comfort, Cold right. Comfort Farm. She wrote some really strange, not particularly terrifying, but definitely warped supernatural stories. Ellen Montgomery, who I believe wrote Anne of Green Gables. I haven't yeah, read it, right, but right. she wrote a pretty good ghost story that we've included. So you get these big, big names. Catherine Mansfield, incredible writer, but very good ghost story writer with a touch of weird. Yes, the, the, the boundaries are fluid. But yes, you, including the big names was important, A, to get the sales, but also to show that these writers were prolific in their... Oh, they're, they're very Catholic approach to genre. They really didn't mind what they wrote. If it made right. a good story, if it produced a good aesthetic effect and presumably paid, that was good enough for them and they'd do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to, it, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has actually studied that phenomenon that, you know, there was this divergence in terms of, and particularly short fiction because it was magazine mm. fiction, right? You yeah, know, it is. Uh, that, you know, uh, it became, you know, by the by the early 1950s, at least in the U.S., mm -hmm. serious short story was New Yorker type short stories. Yeah. And you would never see a ghost in one of those stories. You would never see, you know, a talking statue or something like that. It, they would just not. Ex I mean, they weren't that type of stories. And so they kind of no. like created these barriers which are really sad because you know literature you know literature I, I'm a strong believer that literature is made better by not having boundaries and walls mm -hmm. and things like that well the New Yorker relented in the early 1970s it was publishing Sylvia Townsend Warner's it's true. extraordinary fantasy short stories about Elfin which was collected in Kingdoms of Elfin which we have a new edition of we, that was one of our early um excellent fantasy books so that may have been william maxwell her editor i think that was yeah i mean she yeah. she could have sent anything to yes, william maxwell true. by that time yeah i um, think so they did they did publish fantasy but it's true I, I i'm not an expert on short fiction magazines in the uk from the 50s onwards but i can't think of any you yeah. would get things like lilliput but and also john John Lehman did a series called the New, New Writing Life. Series. New Writing, yeah, the New Writing Series. And I was collecting them for a while. And I, I did a survey, very few women. He was yeah. only interested in publishing men. And it just got monotonous. It was ugly, clumsy, oh, dreadful reading. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So of the stuff that you've published, what what is, uh, can you tell us about a book or two that, you feel is still neglected even even after you're bringing it back in print uh even after i published it and it's still neglected well hmm i don't know I look at my bookshelf hang on <laughs> um they're all there look there they are see that's oh, wow. the handheld collection <laughs> that's my stock for orders um tricky 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 Oh, I love them all. That's the problem. I think Latchkey Ladies, I'm very proud of. Latchkey Ladies is a novel published in 1921 right. um, by Marjorie Grant, who was a Canadian who moved to the UK, no, moved to Europe in the first, first World War. Russia. She was in Russia for a while. Was she? That yeah. I didn't know. I think so. It was Russia or Paris. She wrote a book, a, a non-fiction book. About Verdun, something yeah, it was about it was about the first it was in yeah, the period I think it of the was, first world I think it was war. Paris. I haven't yeah. read it and it was something to do with her nursing in, in France. And then she came to London and she became a friend of Rose Macaulay, which is how I came across the connection because she's mentioned in Sarah Lefanu's Rose Macaulay biography. And in passing, Sarah said, and Marjorie Grant wrote novels. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? So I hunted them down. And I read this one, Latchkey Ladies, which was Grant's first novel after she came back to the UK or came to the UK. And it's about young women working in offices at the end of the First World War and living in shared flats or digs or women's clubs or hostels. And that's pretty extraordinary to find that right. social history evidence in fiction. 
and it focuses on a group of four who have different backgrounds, different, you know, different, different tastes, different life paths. And one of them gets pregnant out of, out of wedlock because she's having an affair with a married man. What does she do? So that was extraordinary enough for 1921. That is really early for that kind of subject material. And what's more amazing is that the publisher and the author did not get prosecuted. And we think it's because Sarah Le Fanu and I were talking a lot about this because she was this, she wrote the introduction. We think it was the skill of the writing. There's one episode where the, the couple go away together to Cornwall and clearly share a bedroom. But the skill of the writing is such that you really wouldn't know. And if you hadn't read the passage before or the passage after, you'd miss it. And the episodes about the pregnancy and the giving birth and all that, very cleverly handled so that nothing could be deemed to be offensive. And then that novel just disappeared from sight. Mm -hmm. And Grant did write a few other novels, but most of her time was spent reviewing for the Times Literary Supplement because that was her income. So her novel writing energy was just drained by having to re review other people's books and probably right. feel quite right. despairing. Um, and it was a job to locate her. In fact, we, we still haven't found her estate. She died. We've seen her will. Her solicitor was given, it said in, in pen, a pen, a pencil note on the will, verbal instructions to be given to solicitor about the, her residual estate, which is where her literary estate would have mm -hmm. gone into. And there is no evidence. I believe the solicitor is still alive. He's not re replying to any letters. I've done a search with the help of the Canadian um, National Library to f trace her relatives, not a thing. Nobody's interested. Um, no. So That's... what can you do? This is what we call an orphan estate. Um, yeah, but we went right. ahead and published anyway, reserving a sum for royalties should she or her, well, should her heirs ever emerge. But this book is just too good to languish. I mean, I, I did a, a um, mm, Conversation with Westminster Libraries. I do a series of talks right, at Westminster right. Libraries and Guildhall Library London. And I did one with Becky, Becky Brown. Becky Brown. Brown. Yeah. yeah. Who's Curtis an expert Brown. on hunting down lost estates. And she was saying, sometimes you cannot publish an author and their work because the heirs will not agree or the estate is divided and you, one will not give permission. And that is almost just tragedy. In mm. Marjorie Grant's case, it could her work could have languished forever unpublished, but I decided no, this is too good. We have to publish this. It's an important novel. It's a wonderful novel. Um, yeah, you actually you asked me to to read it when you were still considering it. I did. I'd forgotten. I told yeah. you. Yes. No, it's a it's a terrific novel and so relevant. I mean, it's uh, the what I remember reading it and thinking of uh, Francesca Wade's. Uh, a group biography square, square haunting square haunting, because yeah. mm -hmm. you know they it's were living the in a place period. that that could have been right there alongside all those absolutely, other absolutely yeah apartments yeah and they weren't doing these the characters are not doing intellectual work they're doing clerical work right they're, one's a chorus girl this is a tranche of society that's simply not written about in the fiction of the period by men women have greater access to it um and marjorie grant she just did a wonderful novel. So that is one I'm very proud of republishing and I wish more people would take notice of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, it is uh, astonishing because it is such a, it's so close to topics that seem to be uh, still very popular and very much written about and, and uh, talked about and, mm -hmm. and reviewed. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a shame because I thought it was a terrific novel too. And I'm yeah. so glad that you did bring it out. <laughs> so uh, so uh, tell us what's coming around the corner. So we have Army Without Banners. Uh, yeah, is there anything January. else you're ready to? Uh... Yeah, we have a few. Um, in May, no, March, we will be publishing a new edition of Rosemary Sutcliffe's childhood memoir, Blue Remembered Hills. Um, Simon Thomas commented that, oh, bit surprised because he had a recent copy. Well, it's out of print um, and it shouldn't be out of print. It's just a wonderful memoir. But our focus on it is that she was a, a woman who lived with disability, quite severe disability. And you would never know that reading this memoir. No, that's not true. You do. Reading her fiction because she was one of the most important writers for children in Britain from 1950 onwards. 
Mm-hmm. And so generations of people have grown up understanding British history through Rosemary Sutcliffe's novels because they read them in the, in the library and at school. But she grew up with a former juvenile arthritis, so her arms were severely foreshortened. She couldn't move her legs. And her mother wouldn't let her have a wheelchair. But after her mother died, she got a wheelchair and immediately freedom. And she and her father went off on a cruise to the Aegean. And that was great. And I got Tom Shakespeare, who is one of Britain's leading disability campaigners, to write the introduction, because I really want to foreground the fact that disability is a condition that many, many people live with and work with. And we need to know more about it and to recognise that, you know, writers who have suppressed it during their own lifetime because of public taste, because of what was considered normal and natural and I don't know, whatever. She had perfectly good reasons for not foregrounding her her impairments in the public eye there are very few pictures of her taken as an adult woman um and then she's in a wheelchair as you can see there are problems with her arms so this is we're doing that in march and it's a fabulous memoir as well beautifully written may we're bringing out the e nesbit ghost stories and then in july no june yeah, we're may june yeah june and july we've got two more that's the last two i'm prepared to tell you about um Both are rediscovered novels by women novelists who have been utterly, utterly forgotten. And they are both absolutely stunning novels. And I'm not going to tell you any more about them. Oh, you're, oh, that's. (laughs) Because the publicity is not yet ready. No. Uh, (laughs) If you sign up to the handheld newsletter, you will. Oh, well, I've signed up, up, but, uh, you know. And that's it. So yeah, we got a good slate for next year so far. That's cool. What 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 was kind of your pace that when you? I mean, what has been your pace of uh, publishing, and and how um, has how have you found that? Um, I started hard to off, keep up with. Uh, yeah, the first two came out together in October twenty seventeen, and I think that was a mistake. I should have staggered them. Um, but that was fine, and then. The first two years, I published seven books a year, and that felt to be a little too much. And in fact, the first one, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to publish seven in the first year, but another one just fell into my lap, and I had to, had to bring it out, and that was a mistake because I got persuaded. But after that, we've stuck to six a year, and six mm-hmm. is fine because you have to leave enough time for marketing, because there's only me. There's my husband who does all the numbers. He does bookkeeping, helps with the accounts, does all the stock management and number crunching and data analysis, because that's his skills. That was his day job. And I do anything to do with editorial, multitasking. I run all the marketing. And it takes a lot of energy to do Mm -hmm. marketing thinking. And I can't do marketing for two books at the same time. It just does my head in. I can using social media. I can write social media posts in in a single day about five different books, and that will be fine. But trying to create a marketing campaign and to produce the copy and design the adverts, I don't know. No. So six a year is fine. I have a superb designer. I have a very loyal social media um, freelance. And I use like obviously printers and web design and data and ebook tran- uh, conversion. I, I, con- I get contractors to do that. Mm-hmm. But it's pretty much me. So I have to time things so that I can cope with it. Because if I can't right. do it, nobody else can. Mm-hmm. Impeccable taste in your choice of color illustrations, too, by the way. (laughs) I love the picture research. It's really important to me that the cover images um, are contemporaneous with the text. So they have to have been produced within a year or two of the book first coming out, because that gives the flavor of the period. It's not just the costumes and the hairstyles and and it's the aesthetics, the way that the artwork looks. And I think that really helps. And if I can try and find an image that reflects an aspect of the plot, if it's a novel or you know something else about the book, that's even better. But I love doing picture research. That's not and, easy either. I mean, despite no. the fact of the amount of material that's online, actually, from my experience, image search is is like the most unproductive part of well, the whole process. Yeah, we have a budget, so I usually go straight to Mary Evans Picture Library, which has a superb source of commercial art and graphic design, which is where most of our images come from, from adverts and from illustrations in manuals and things and magazine covers. I I would never take an image 
from the internet for free because the quality of the, of the file will be far too small. You can't, it's just not good enough to use as an image file for a cover. Once we did that, there was a particular image we wanted for Strange Relics, which is our anthology of ar supernatural archeological stories. It came out earlier this year, I think, I forget. And no, it was last year. And it was a fantastic image and it existed online in the internet archive because the, the magazine it came from was in there, but you could not scrape the image to any size it was usable. So I thought, well, that's that magazine, I'll, I'll just look it up on eBay. And I found it on eBay and I bought it for $20 from California and it arrived in the post and we scanned the image and there we have beautiful high resolution image mm -hmm. and it cost hardly anything. So yeah. that was a triumph. And we were very yeah. fortunate that there was an issue available to use. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I mean, they're they're certainly uh, one of the highlights of, uh, and and the table appeal is an important factor, isn't it, in terms of people picking up the books? And... Oh yes, yeah. Well, the the book fair I was doing today and last night, people were standing and looking at the pictures. I just have to get them to put their hand on the book, <laughs> and then they're done. <laughs> so it's like a hook; you reel them in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been great. I, I want to open it up. If uh, anyone in the audience uh, has a question or a comment they want to make, I don't want to uh, silence you. So please just feel free to go off of mute. Otherwise, we'll come in, continue chatting uh, here. <laughs> Let's see who we got. Oh, I see Andrea. Yes. Um, Kate, you said that when you read the um, book by Michael Carney mm -hmm. on Hilda Matheson originally, when you picked it up, it had Stoker in the title. And you said, ah. I think you didn't, you didn't quite understand what it meant. And neither do I. And so I was wondering no. if you could explain and a bit. Come, yes, I should it. have said that. You're quite right. It's a really awful title because it means nothing to the reader. And mm -hmm. but it comes from the nickname that Vita Sackville West gave to Hilda Matheson or Hilda liked to call herself a little stoker, meaning someone who fuels the engines in a ship or a train or something um, because she came from the, steep, the, the coal powered age. And so Michael presumably picked on that as sort of emblematic of Hilda's self-sacrifice her constant hard work, her sense of always serving others and doing work so that others will benefit from it. And he made it the title, but it's absolutely bloody awful title because it says nothing. And that's why, well, we, we just had Hilda Matheson because that made a lot of sense. And then we used a subtitle because our sales reps insist on subtitles because it, the more information on the cover, the better. And I could not think of a subtitle. And then a day or two later, my husband and I went out for pizza. And in between mouths of pizza, my, my husband said, how about a life of secrets and broadcasts? And I nearly exploded. <laughs> that, that's fine. We'll have that. Good. Yeah, it'll do. Because it says it all. It's secrets and also broadcasts, the BBC and, and spreading the word. It may not be perfect, but it's a lot better than Stoker. Yeah. And also, I was wondering if you had any interest from the German academic com community at all. There are British centres, you know, British centres at German yeah. universities in the speak, English department. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and lots of students studying English literature and language in Germany. So is, is there any in, sort of sustained interest well, in Germany at all? Well, I, I have former German colleagues at um, uh, Paderborn and uh, another a university quite near Paderborn. I used to teach at Paderborn as a visiting professor when I was an academic. So they know all about me and I know, and also I think Constance, University of Constance. So they've been using it and I've had at least, I've had, contact with at least one German academic who could not get the books after Brexit so I had to arrange for the books to go a different way mm. um, and we have had German publishers pick up on our editions and translate them so our one our first Rose Macaulay title whatnot has been published in German um, because we had made it available again so I mean but that's that's the only contact I've had but in general it's not me who should be contacted if academics want to a do translations they have to go to the estate which isn't me i don't own the rights for translations other people the, the estates do or if they want to acquire copies for students then they have to talk to the the book distribution network which means their own bookshops 
and that's all set in place, but it's not me. I can point them in the right direction and send them on, but I don't have any decision making in that respect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Any anyone else uh, have a question or a comment they'd like to make? Okay, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for that, Kate. I always enjoy your talks. I've been on, on quite 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 a few of your particular talks. I find this is quite quite. Well, I just turn the lights a bit strange. I find this. <laughs> this I, I find, find this is. Yeah, I'm in my easy chair. I put the heating on, by the way. First time this year, I've treated myself right. to put the heating on and and list listening to you. I think this is a remarkable story because I mean, obviously, we. we I mean, this, the buzzword about is all these sort of. Uh, recovery reprints or re, uh, recovery but this seems like it's almost like a, another iteration of that that this is a self-published book mm -hmm. that you discover that seems to be like perhaps only one or few copies of this yeah and then this illuminates a figure in the history of the bbc who you thought would already be well known about and i, I think this mm. is i think it speaks widely what brad has been talking about as well here is that we get people writing about the cultural history of the period drawing upon sources and yet you're starting to think this is only a very very partial view a very very mm. partial view. and then when such a major figure like like this is neglected and 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 has to be discovered through a chance discovery in a secondhand bookshop you start thinking well i think academics particularly need to really think about whether they are using well we know they're not using all the sources no, it's, it's, it's 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 as simple as, as that and that they're thinking mm. no the offense to kate but academics are really lazy they will go to the easily the known the low the hanging fruits that have already kind of created finding aids and yeah. Uh, I'm in that world myself. I'm in that world myself. Mm -hmm. I know. Yes, yes. I, I'm. I'm. I'm always in, intrigued. But also, can you also? I, I don't want to di monopolize. So, but this intrigue is: how did this Michael Carney character himself become interested in her when it's seeming like oh. no one else? Hmm. I, th I think he's ex BBC. I think he's an ex BBC ah, right. staff member. So he would have known about her through the history, which he may have investigated on his own account. Not professionally, but because he had the access to the, the BBC archives at Caversham, perhaps, in New Reading. Mm. I also think part of the problem with Hilda's elision from history is that she's a woman. Mm. And women what? are historically the ones who don't don't, you know, don't get notice paid of them. The um the Africa history, the Africa survey that she was her last major work, if you like, that was republished in the 1950s, and her name was no longer in it. She had been dropped from it, even though the first edition made it fairly clear that she was a leading contributor to it and the book could not have been created without her. Um, so there was, you know, women have been removed from history, suppressed in history. It's a common, common thing. We don't really need to go over that. But I think it's, in, it's, <clears throat> it's symptomatic that she was a woman and therefore people don't know about her story. And it takes an independent publisher which is very female focused and feminist to take the interest and dig her out and give her prominence again. And I think it's absolutely, no, it's, it's also not an accident that most of the recovery reprint houses are women focused and they always have been historically. Other, other houses that um, focus on genre, that's different. So Dean Street Press doing an awful lot of detection fiction and British Library doing detection and fantasy reprints. But when you think about Virago, um, Women's Press, and also Persephone, who was a great inspiration, and there are other themes. I mean, even you know, Broadview is a bit academic, but you know, fe feminist history and the recovery of women writers is absolutely central to the recovery reprint. I know business activity, if you like. Well, there's an appetite. There's an audience for that. There's a, there is an audience. There, yes. there, women, women have kind of, you know, Braga really broke the ice with mm. Persephone also built up, you know, a loyal customer base that yeah, very uh, loyal. embraces mm. embraces the, you know, Simon Thomas with the British Library, your series. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's tapping into a demand. I mean, let's face it, there's a demand for this stuff. stuff. Mm. The, the larger publishers are not going to, um, risk their money on you know bringing out yeah <clears throat> absolutely uh deborah has her, her hand raised if you don't mind i'll let me mm -hmm. just add a highlight here 
can you hear that? I can. Hello. Yep. Hello. Hello. Um, yes, I think what you're both doing is amazing. Um, and I began, um, I'm very nervous. Um, I began researching women who'd been neglected and ignored mm -hmm. uh, in the 1990s. Uh, I'd worked as a um, publicity manager with Waterstones uh -huh. and I'd been working on a, an MA uh, from a, femi a research MA from a feminist perspective on women and work in a series of 19th century mm -hmm. texts. Anyway, long story short, um, I was involved in a massive quilts and banners project as part of Preston Guild. We celebrated Preston women, commemorative quilts and banners, all the rest of it, major. Now, at the time, I was the only member of the National Women's History Project in America. They made it their business to look at the dearth of material that there was in schools on women's mm. history. They sat around the table and typical Yanks got their act together, started producing things to get them into schools. I mean, yeah. just as you, as you would, as you would. Um, so I'd, I wanted to set something up like that here. Mm -hmm. After the project was over, because I wasn't with a university, I did two, two years unpaid work on the piece of history project for the Preston World Women's Centre. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't assigned to a university, I couldn't afford to go to America to work with them. So one of the directors came and stayed with us to find out more about the project. Now, in between, I've now gone on to, I'm researching a biography of Britain's female, first female speedway rider from the 1920s. Wow. Who mm -hmm. raced with other women. Mm -hmm. And I've forever been told that there were no women who raced. There were no postcards of women at postcard fairs. And there I am. I have postcard proof of <laughs> women. But, yeah. I mean, there we are. Usually men who tell me. Mm -hmm. But to get back to the, to get back to the, um, why I think it, it, it's so valuable, so important what you're doing to recover these women to increase awareness, hopefully, hopefully to get them out. Mm. It, it, I'd love them to go into schools, but we need an army. We need an army of people <laughs> like me who make it the business. I mean, I've got this, oh, can you, you can't see this, can you, this no. cover? Is there any way I can put the camera on so you can see the cover of this? I think you'd have to turn it on yourself. Yeah, you have to turn it on yourself. Start, start my video. There oh, you go. This book, Clippies. Oh, they Clippy. hold, hold it up again. Oh, Clippy. Okay, for the women, women bus conductors. Oh, that That's right. Wonderful. And I found that in a bookshop. I'm mm -hmm. shaking here. I found that in a bookshop and I paid all of five pounds for it. It's the yeah. autobiography of a wartime conductress. Oh, and that looks fab. It's brilliant. It's This is the... Um, inside, it's got, which just, I was thrilled, Women's Book Club, um, six, something, two and six, and yeah. I paid five pounds. And yeah. it's written on wartime paper, uh, you know, when there was a, a yeah, shortage. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is another one you could look it's, at. It looks of real interest, yeah. I mm -hmm. can think immediately of people who would be very interested in seeing a copy of that. Is yeah. it photocopyable? Is the spine in good nick? Could you put it on a photocopier or scan it? I'm sure I could. Okay, right. Yeah. Well, if you want, I'm send, sure me, a, <laughs> send <laughs> me an email, um, which is inquiries at handheldpress.co.uk, and I will see about putting you in contact with people who'd like to know about that book. Because right. I know, yeah, I don't think it's something I would do, but right. I'm pretty sure there will be. Mm -hmm. I thought... I think I've done some research on the. I, I, once I start, I just cannot. I get so excited. I rush yeah. home and do the research. I think I've done some uh, some um, research on on 
the uh, authors. Mm -hmm. So I'll try and find that. But yes, I'll, I'll do that. And yeah, do get in touch. But thank you both. It's great. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, and thank you for giving us another lead. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Well, we're well, well past the uh, the hour, and uh, I if there are no other questions or comments from uh, the audience, I just want to thank Kate for taking the time, and thank you for publishing such fabulous books. Oops, Andrea, would would you? Oh, are, are you? That's clapping, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. So yeah, I mean. Best of luck, and uh, thank you for taking the time to to talk with us. And well, thank, uh, thank you, for you all, everyone me. in the audience for joining. It was a great discussion. This will be available on the Neglected Books YouTube channel as soon mm -hmm. as I get it converted and uploaded, and all of that sort of stuff. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, happy reading, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.